Hi, everyone, and welcome to another in my series of Cozy Things Chats. And I am joined today by a bookish friend, Susan. And Susan is a part of my Read Along Most Victorian Patreon book club. And that is how we have gotten to know each other. So it's been really lovely. And Susan, thank you for being willing to be a guest. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a little nervous. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I've watched your series and I love them. So I was uh, so pleased when you asked. So Oh, well, I'm so glad. And I just thought you say, seemed like a great uh, candidate for this because of what the cozy things that we have talked about. I was like, I feel like she'll have some good ones. And you obviously enjoy Victorian literature. I do. Um, Yes. And you also like reading mysteries and a fair amount of nonfiction in there. Yes. Um, and you also enjoy Rosamond Pilcher. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Well, I look forward to hearing your cozy things <laughs> and let's dive right in. So what is the first cozy thing? So everything that will be, as I, as I said, sort of book adjacent. So I have props, you know, I, I have to have, you know, a book. So I'm sure you'll appreciate this because, you know, the first thing I, and when I thought about like, what are my, my cozy things was um, the library. And so, and how important it was to me, um, you know, growing up and how, how momentous it was to get my first library card, like how that was such a rite of passage. Um, and so I, um, and I know you, I think yesterday was library or today's was library appreciation day. Right? Yes, it's today. Yeah. The 16th. Yeah. So the librarians. And, um, and I, and I also sort of thought about like libraries and how important they are in the social fabric. Of, of our communities. Mm -hmm. And I remember it's sort of like, I, I don't know if you read Dewey, which was about the cat in the library, which if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. I don't have a copy of it, unfortunately, or it would be a prop too. And that uh, where it was a smaller town library and really how they morphed and they, they incorporated different things into the library to support the community like baking pans. So if you were baking a special cake or, um, you know, for an event, like a lot of people just, you wouldn't necessarily have that on hand and you wouldn't want to go out and buy it, but you could check one out from your library and they had tools and stuff like that. Ooh. And so, um, you know, I love uh, the, the book by Susan um, Orlean, uh, because it also has sort of the history of, of the, the Los Angeles library and just, you know, the really interesting characters and, um, you know, and how it's also evolved where we now have this whole electronic library community, which was yeah. critical, I think, for during the pandemic where you're like, Oh I can't go to the library. You know, there was a period of time, especially where I live, because uh, we were uh, in lockdown for a, quite a, a while. Mm -hmm. So it was really great knowing that my library had a tremendous resource for me to tap into. So, yeah. oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I could I could sing the praises of of the library all day, right? and um, yeah, just touching on to that concept of the library offering things besides kind of books and movies too. And my, the library close to me calls it a library of things. Um, and they have, I think they have Lego sets for one, which I would be, my son would be excited to get to try them out. Although I would worry we would lose some of the pieces. So okay. <laughs> or like um, jigsaw puzzles and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. We've checked out games before. Um, and yeah, they're just, I mean, they're amazing resources. And when I was at the library today, there was even somebody there. He was filing his taxes because he didn't have the internet at home. Um, and so he needed help like printing out the form and they're just, yeah, they're wonderful and just so essential. Yeah. And I loved how the booktube community has really been giving a shout out over the last couple of months to, to libraries and how, you know, critical and, and honoring them and being grateful for them. So that was sort of my first cozy thing. And, I, and also the architecture too, like 
architecture of libraries. Some of them are some of the most beautiful, you know, like the New York Public Library. Oh my goodness. Right, and the two lions in front, patience and fortitude, I think it is. Um, oh. You know, I mean, just this tremendous sense of history, so. Absolutely. I really loved where we lived um, when Peter was a baby, the library close by was in an old mansion and, and I had nothing else to do then. So we would walk to the library every day <laughs> and just go in and hang out. And it was very cozy because it was in a mansion. Um, so yeah, it is cool too. The, just the variety in architecture there. Yeah, no, I am. Um... Yeah, so, and that sort of segues into the next uh, cozy thing is, I love going to historic homes. So it's one of my most favorite things I, my entire life. And, you know, I really um, credit my mom uh, because uh, when we lived on the East Coast, we went, I probably, you know, there, there, was an, there wasn't a historic home that we missed. <laughs> <laughs> and so that in Shaker community, she loved the, the Shaker community. So yeah. that to me, and it was great, you know, going to homes of literary figures and, you know, it. so that I've always, and I have a prop for that too. So um, Julia Morgan, this is a lovely book and there's a new biography coming out uh, uh, of her. Um, but she was the first female licensed architect in California, and oh. she was the architect of San Simeon. So she did about, I think, 700 plus buildings, you know, oh. I mean, she was prolific, but wow. she had some really prime um, uh, buildings that she did or commissions. I was struggling for the word there. Um, I think she also did some stuff on the Berkeley campus and, and whatnot. So shout out to Julia because she's pretty amazing and, and wow. really a lovely, lovely. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to San Simeon. No, I have not. Um, opulent. It's definitely opulent, but it's got that whole sort of 30s vibe to it too, mm -hmm. right? So you're just like, you're like waiting for, you know, like Nick and Nora Charles you know, <laughs> coming out, having a cocktail. And I, um, and the stories are, are just tremendous when you go there, especially of the, the, you know, the golden age of Hollywood and how Hearst, because, um, uh, Marion Davies had a, had an alcohol problem. She she had a substance oh. abuse problem. So he would limit the amount of drinks. So of course there would be like they were like teenagers trying to like have these small parties in their rooms before you know dinner and and stuff. So uh, wild times oh. at uh, <laughs> at Hearst Castle, uh, getting around uh, you know William Hearst uh, laying down oh. the wall. <laughs> now back to the literary homes on the east coast was there any home in particular that you were like oh that is my favorite that I've um, seen I would say and I'm doing this from memory because it, it it was a a long time ago but um going up in Massachusetts I mean there's really sort of that um, Susan Cheever did a really great book about it called uh, American Bloomsbury, which was sort of like that genius oh. cluster, you know, and how she sort of talked about, which is, I guess, a theory, like at certain times you have genius clusters where people cluster together. Mm -hmm. um, so going up and, and seeing, you know, sort of, uh, everything from the the Alcott from where, like where where Fruitlands was and and yeah. you know, uh, the Hawthorne and, and and all of that and then um you know Emily Dickinson certainly mm -hmm. yeah it's nice because once you get up there there's a whole cluster yeah yeah. And, I, and I recommend that book too, because it's, it's great because you've got these wonderful, you know, lions of American literature, you know, the yeah. Alcott's and Hawthorne and Mel Emerson. Emerson, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and oh, I think cool. you had read Eden's Outcast, right? Am I yes, it was amazing. It right. has really stayed with me. Um, and I would love to see Fruitlands and, and the Alcott household. Yeah, it would be amazing. 
So the one that is kind of close to me um, is Pearl Buck's house. I don't know if you've read anything by her. I have. I've read um, The Good Earth. Yes. And then I, um, oh, The Pavilion of Women, I want to say I read. That sounds vaguely familiar. And it does, it totally sounds like a Pearl Buck title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I and it's more than I've read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they um, it's it looks really special too. They've made it very much kind of a foundation home, and so they do a lot of events in the community. And um, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think it's a bit of a community center actually. Um, so that would be that would be cool. It looks yeah, just it's a beautiful home, and it would be neat to to go and learn more. I really I, yeah, I'm I'm just thinking about. It. I have not uh, visited any author homes so. That hopefully on the agenda eventually. Yeah, it would be great to do sort of like a, a map and sort of of the different ones yes. in the different states. Cause like out on the West Coast, there's like Thomas Mann's house and you know, Steinbeck um, up in you know Northern yes. California. And um, you know, you could just sort of do this whole sort of great trip and maybe do like yes. bookstore adjacent too. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, great, absolutely. Of course. Right? Like yes. great new bookstores too, adjacent yes. to it. So yeah, I think number one on my list is Maud Hart Lovelace's um, childhood home no, in um, yeah, in Mankato. Now she does have, I think I I could in theory, like I could find out her address when she and Delos lived in New York City. And I could walk by the building, but it's nothing I could, you know, go inside. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, some of, didn't one of the Mitford sisters live in California? Uh, Florida. Why did I think California? Maybe she ended up, are you thinking of Jessica? Maybe Jessica. I just said her one and I can't remember which sister. So Jessica was the one um, who was termed the communist of the family mm -hmm. and she lived in Florida and New York. Now they may have come out to California, but I, I don't remember. That. Okay. But okay. It's, maybe it, yeah. You should just... absolutely be right. I remember I... <laughs> Florida and New York, but California could be, you know, definitely well, on the, the, the whole, you know, journey for, yeah. for her. No, you sound like you've actually read about it. Like I haven't even read about it. So um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll have to look that up later. Yeah, you'll be hearing about the Mitfords in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, perfect. Now, I guess, shall we move on to cozy item number three? So, um, you know, this is a uh, pretty common too, but audiobooks. So for me, um, because I have a long commute, it is, it, it is a saving grace. And I find what I resonate with most in in traffic is a really good um, nonfiction or cozy mystery. Um, th oh. Those seem to be like my two like sweet spots with with listening. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a nonfiction that requires a lot of like in depth analysis and thinking about I have there there was one time I was reading and I don't know why or listening to it, I was um, Capital by Thomas Pinckney and it was like it was a hot my the, the air conditioning wasn't working it was an oh. older car and I was just like and and I hated the book I mean just really loathed it and I was like I'm just gonna get out and leave my car here that's <laughs> in traffic I'm leaving it oh uh, that's awful <laughs> I know right um, oh. so I do find that. Um, that and also because I love to do fiber art, so you know knitting and needlepoint and cross stitch, um, it it it's it's very sort of con calming, you know, yes. to do that and to listen to a lovely book. Uh, I was mm -hmm. going to say contemplative, but that's it, it's probably not really that. Um, so and it it also adds sort of the performative depth. I find. Uh, there have been certain books that I, I tried to read, and although I don't read a lot of contemporary fiction anymore, um, like Lincoln and the Bardo, uh, as an oh. example, I like tried to read it and I was like, there's just, uh, this is not, I'm not getting this, and I know he's brilliant, and I just <laughs> don't get it. And I listened to it, and because it was the variety of voices, 
it was it was oh. as if I was listening to you know a performance at, or wow. a play, and I just loved it. So, oh, yeah, audiobooks are so wonderful, and especially when you think back hundreds of years ago, um, stories were first experienced that way. Someone telling this story, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I just think about things like Beowulf, you know. Yes. Um, yeah. So, um, now, do any, you, oh, sorry. What's I'm that? sorry. I was going to ask you, cause I I've noticed this, that happens to me. I find sometimes that I remember an audio book better than I do actually physically reading that. And I wonder if it's part of that whole sort of, you know, we're, we're programmed for this audio, you know, for this narrative that this is how, you know, uh, it's in our DNA that we were told stories in, in this way. So yeah. I don't know, do you, do you find that? Or? If it's a really good audiobook, definitely. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the, oh my goodness, the Juliet Stevenson Middlemarch is okay. one of those. And her Jane Eyre, like she is just my queen with audiobooks. Yes. Um, she's so good. And then I just finished listening to for our Patreon um, book club, the Nicholas, is it oh, so annoying? Um, I'm going to put it in the description down below. <laughs> um, and his narration of David Copperfield, it was just he was he was my friend was telling me this story of everything that had happened to him. Um, yeah, yeah. There are some audiobooks that just really, really stick out and are just splendidly done. So can you think maybe a couple off the top of your head, maybe one nonfiction and one cozy mystery? Sure. Um, I say that and then watch, we'll just have like five minutes of like me staring <laughs> at you. Um, so I just finished, um, the newest Nancy Goldstone which is about the Empress uh, Maria Theresa and uh, her daughters. Um, and that wow. was amazing. I really loved it. It was interesting. Um, she's very engaging as a historian. Um, and so that I absolutely loved and the, the narrator whose name of, I apologize, I, I don't have, um, was, was really wonderful. And then um, I will um, say the, the Molly Murphy series, Yay. as far as cozy mysteries, um, those uh, as audiobooks are just so delightful. Oh, yeah, I really wish I had access to the audiobooks of those. I listened to a sample after you were saying how much you had enjoyed it. And it just sounds so fun, but unfortunately there's no, not through the library and I'm not willing to like do the, do the damage of, of, you know, buying each audiobook. but they sound so fun. Another, um, cozy mystery series, a historical mystery series too, that is really wonderful on audio is the Mitford sisters, um, yes. mystery series by Jessica fellows. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the name of that narrator either. I'll put all the information. I know, in right? I feel so bad because they're so critical. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember your name. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, and do you also enjoy um, Louise Penny's books? I do. Oh, and so Gamache, when. Gamache, Gamache. Yes. And when the first narrator passed away, like prematurely, I was like, I don't know. He's got big shoes to feel. Yeah. But um, I can remember the current narrator's name, Robert Bathurst. And um, he, he, have you watched Downton Abbey? Yes. So he is the very much older love interest of um, Edith very early in the series. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And he, it's, I just, hearing his voice in the show, I would have never been like, oh, he should narrate an audiobook. But he has, kind of, I love it when narrators have kind of like a gravelly quality to their voice. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so he's not the same. He's not going to be able to do it the same as the original narrator, but he's really good too. So I'm glad they were able to find someone who was able to kind of step up to the plate. 
Yeah, and I'm so glad she continued this series because I guess yes. at one point when her husband passed away, she it was so it was such an intertwined process that she wasn't sure she could continue. And I'm so glad that she she decided to because I feel there's an additional depth to them, you know, that mm. she's added um, since since that, you know, and there's maybe a there's the the frailty that that's you know of life and of, of relationships and how important it is to treasure them um, absolutely they're just so beautifully emotionally vulnerable when you read them and yeah that just really treasuring <laughs> treasuring your people um yeah yeah that everything can change in an instant and yeah oh all all good such good books i know uh, right? we're so lucky there's so many are, great things we are so there. lucky <laughs> yes. Now, one nonfiction title that sticks out to me that I feel like could be good on audio, although I have not listened to it on audio, is Romantic Outlaws. I, you know, I don't know if that's on audio. I have okay. a digital version of that, and I've been meaning to read that uh, oh. because, uh, yeah, because I know you've spoken so highly of it. Um, and it, I mean, it is just like reading a gossip column. Like it is. <laughs> It is unbelievably scandalous, like <laughs> even by modern standards, like they were, you know, like the kind of the pre-Raphaelite, they weren't pre-Raphaelites, but kind of that just laissez-faire, like, whoa, mm -hmm. they did what, what? I mean, Lord Byron like features as one of the players in this. So bad, bad and dangerous to know. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, very much so. Oh. Alrighty, shall we move on to cozy thing number four? Sure. So um, this is going to be sort of an easy one: rereads and seasonal reads. So I I have really um, and I, I've always been a rereader, but I certainly think that the the pandemic jump started a little too, where you're just like Ooh. you look at your library and you say. I have so much. Why am I not like rereading you? Um, yeah. So there are two favorites. And I also, it's a shout out to for, I love sort of like pocket size books. So, oh. um, right. Aren't these just um, yes. wonderful? So the first one is, um, I know it's, it, you know, like Austin and Bronte are wonderful rereads and, and most Victorian literature is like a wonderful reread because even if you know the story, you can still, you know, find something new to sort of you're, you're plumbing that that sort of reading depth. Um, yes. For me, Edith Wharton happens to be a real favorite that I love mm. to read and reread. Um, I love the characters. Um, I just picked The Age of Innocence, but, you know, The Custom of the Country, The House of Mirth. Uh, the Reef um, are all ones that I will go back to, you know, mm. on more than one occasion. Um, and so I would definitely, um, you know, we a lot of people don't talk about some of the American authors as much as it's we talk very about true. a lot of the British authors. And there's a, a, a wonderful, you know, uh, complement of British authors to constantly talk about. But um, I do want to give some shout outs to some American authors who I think are pretty wow. fabulous. And Edith Wharton um, would definitely be one of them. And then for seasonal reads, it, this is like the quintessential spring slash summer read is I Capture the Castle by Dodie. Yeah. And I just, those Mortmains, I just love them. <laughs> and, you know, they have the moat and they're dying the, you know, everything they die green. And, you know, I mean, you just have to, 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 to love it. Um, so those are, are kind of like my two, two shout outs on, oh. um, you know, rereads and seasonal reads. <laughs> What's funny is to you talking about them dyeing things green jogs my memory too. When Rose orders a cream de menthe and Cassandra's like, she just ordered it because she knew it would look good next to her hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, they are, I mean, quite the eccentric family and are just delightful to, to follow. Is her stepmother Topaz? Is that her name? Yes. Topaz. Yeah, just the whole, all of it. I just, the very like milk toast Americans and this 
eccentric British family living in a crumbling castle. It's been a few years since I've read I Capture the Castle. I'm due for a reread at some point. I guess I'm a little scared to reread it because in my memory, I have loved it so much. And um, I was telling my husband that I think a bad reread is the most painful kind of reading that you can have because it's like having a friend that betrays you. And like, I thought I knew you, <laughs> but <laughs> but it's it's a book that you loved so at some point I will read I'll, I'll work up the courage to reread it yeah no it's definitely worth it so in now, my mind. oh what's that in my mind anyway <laughs> yes <laughs> now Edith Wharton I read um the one with Lily Bart is the age of innocence uh that is the house of mirth the house of mirth I I don't know why I always had trouble remembering which title it was but that book shattered me. It was so um, incredibly like suffocating with how immersive her writing is. Like he, her writing is pristine. And so many, she's, she's like George Eliot, but maybe a little bit more intense. Um, yeah, yeah, she, it was, it was an astounding read and really just, yeah, just, I mean, some amazing characters. And my brother is actually, he's a big fan of, of Edith Wharton. Um, so he was on my case to read The Age of Innocence and then I finally did. He was supposed to read Wives and Daughters, but he didn't hold up his end of the deal. So. <laughs> well, maybe sometime, right? Maybe sometime, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, books come to you at different times. And I mean- It's very true. I know I've read or picked up a book and I'm like, it's just not resonating. And then I'll pick yes. it up maybe even like a couple of years later. I'm like, what was my problem? This is a wonderful book. Yes, yes. Well, now there's gonna be a theme because in the past two Cozy Things chats, Gina Stanier first recommended Miss Reed. And I told her my whole dilemma where I love the Miss Reed Christmas books but I tried the other ones, just the standard like Thrush Green and Fair Acre, and they were too quiet. And she's like, oh, please. Like, I really think, you know, if you try them again, you might enjoy them. And it was something clicked, something magic. And I have just been loving them. And now I'm like, you know, what? I'm so glad I didn't force it before yeah. because then it would have been like that, that novel that you had to read in high school, like A Tale of Two Cities, or some people even hate Jane Eyre because they had to read it for school. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad it just came at the right time now. And then it was so fun because I recorded a chat with Janelle and she also recommended Miss Reed. And I was like, I'm happy to report. I, I'm converted now. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's really something to be said for kind of having a, an organic experience with your reading. Sometimes you have to read things, you know, right. but yeah, it's fun. If you yeah, can. no, I, I, um, I think it's nice like I mean I know some people call it mood reading or whatever but it's just assessing sort of you know is a book is this just a book I never want to pick up again or is there something going on in my life and my attention span and and what I'm you know focused on and this just doesn't click with me but it's 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 got potential and you know I know so many you know readers who have recommended it, whose, you know, opinions I trust. And, you know, yes. so I think it's, it's good to just, you know, reading should be fun. Like you should yes. enjoy it. Thank like, you. You know, I mean, yes. don't yes. beat yourself up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. There are just, and there are also just the sheer volume of books that are out there. Um, it's not going to get, it's not going to go away. This kind of just so many books I want to read. So yeah, exactly. you can, you can always, you can always try again later if a book is not working for you at the time that you're trying it. Yeah. And libraries always have them. <laughs> they do. And well, and then also even I, I go to the like worst case scenario of like the library wouldn't have it. Finding used books online now is unbelievably easy. You just, you know, type in a few things and with the click of the mouse, you can order a book come straight to your door so it yeah wonderful I mean we are so lucky because it used to when I was growing up there, you didn't have that and so you had to literally go to a bookstore or it's yes. you know what estate and yard sales I love how every yard sale was always an estate sale um and you know that's where a lot of times you got like some of those great you know older um books I happen to love um 
you know, older, older editions that, uh, you know, or the naked hardback or where like uh, oh. the, when you, you're, uh, you had the um, girl of the limber loss. I love those, yes. those where they have the sort of uh, picture imprint and the rest of it is, yes. and that's where you would have to go. I mean, that was, it was, you really had to like, you know, do that or hope that you were in a city that had a really thriving used bookstore. So. Yes. And I know I've heard from Betsy Tacey fans that from the like 1970s to the 1990s, you, it was, you know, not all libraries had the series because it wasn't as popular. And so they would just scour yard sales and some of them would have loved some in the series, but they didn't have all the books. And so they would just be hoping and praying. And so then it was in the nineties, they did the individual bind ups and then sometime late like 2008 or something that's when they did like the bind up at harbor perennial did the bind up so i just oh i can't imagine it's it's terrible just to think about <laughs> not having <laughs> not having like just yeah just knowing there's more betsy books out there yeah oh. well that's a really good lead in you in know a, in, a, in a way um to the next one, which is um, because of channels like yours and some others, um, I really started to love illustrated books again. Um, oh. And so I, um, I have two here. Um, one I think uh, will resonate with you, which is the Illustrated oh. Goblin Market which I read the other morning on my way before I went to, to the office. And it was oh. such a wonderful way to start the day. I was just like, this is, su I'd never read it before. Um, and oh. the illustrations were just so, um, I'm sorry, the lighting is probably oh really goodness. horrible here. Um, but yeah, this is such a great addition. Um, and, and I realized how much I, I loved illustrated but or books with illustrations and maybe that's the best way to to say it. like I, in reading um for the patreon book club uh, reading the the david copperfield i have um the macmillan uh collector's oh. edition and it has the 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 sketches in it and that was, yes. so, it was so lovely in reading it and how nice it is um yes. and then um i have to give a shout out to folio um because they do such wonderful editions, and this is the pursuit of love. And Nancy Mitford is a is a huge favorite of mine. Um, and so these are just. Um, I have seen the I've I've seen them um, in person at a used bookstore, and mm -hmm. um, they are yeah. It kind of I feel like it looks a bit like Art Nouveau the style. Yeah, Here, I don't um, know. I'm hoping these are. Yeah, those so, are, that's beautiful. It is, and oh. I encourage everyone to check your used bookstore because I picked this up at I picked up both of them, um, because I have a Pursuit of Love and Love in a Cold Climate at a used bookstore. So oh. I it was a and they were in pristine condition and that's um, wonderful. I know, right? I was so happy about it. <laughs> Man, the Pursuit of Love is such a powerful book, and I oh, it's just. It's so punchy. I love it because it's one of those like, here we are all schmoozing and, you know, kind of just doing our <laughs> aristocratic type things. Um, but it has such deep, powerful themes to it. And so mm -hmm. I think it's kind of one of those that afterwards you're like, whoa, what, what just happened? You think it's people kind of want to, if, you know, the, I think if people would just see a trailer for the adaptation, they'd be like, oh, wow, it's this light, you know, uh, kind of uh, right, yeah, thing kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And it does have that setting. It has that backdrop, but it is, I mean, you can, I think you can tell it's about people that she knew up close and personal. And it was a, it's a very personal story. Yeah. I did like um, Love in a Cold Climate, but for some reason, the pursuit of love just really hit home with me more. It's, um, you know, it's, it's always been my sort of like go-to slump book. So if I'm like having some, it's either that or a cozy mystery, but you know, I always know that I'm going to enjoy the experience mm. and still love the characters. Mm -hmm. And so I, it's, 
And I agree with you, there are some really interesting themes because there's certainly, um, you know, because it is all of sort of the lead up to, you know, and, and the beginning of World War II, mm-hmm. there is definitely, um, you know, these familial themes where, wow. and, and I'm really fascinated. It's, it's one thing that I've always, there were, there's this whole host of, of women writers who never had formal education, and yet they wrote mm-hmm. these really memorable stories. Um, you know, Nancy Mitford being one of them. I mean, they were let loose on their, their library. That was, that was the education for the, uh, she and her sisters. So, yeah. I mean, when you think about it, it's like, it is, it's unreal. Yeah. Like kind of, yeah, just self self self-made women. And I could be wrong about this, but I think George Eliot also may have not had formal education. Um, and yeah, just what, I mean, what a pillar of like (laughs) literature she is. Yeah. I mean, that is, I think that's encouraging too, to, I mean, it is really nice to have a title, but also you can, you can be a lifelong learner. Like you really can, if you want to be, um, (laughs) I don't, I don't ever pretend to think though, that I would, I would be a George Eliot or a Nancy Mitford, but I'll enjoy reading their books. (laughs) Right. No. And I just, you know, I'm very, and it's also, it is a very distinctive difference because, you know, the U S we had, you know, um, an educational system in place fairly early on. So true. a lot of, um, you know, female authors that would be contemporaries had some education, um, versus, you know, some of their British counterparts. So that's a very good point. Yeah. Well, are we, what number are we at? Are we at six? Um, Hold on, I have my list. Oh, number six. Yes, very good. So, (laughs) and I think you, you love this in a lot of your audience, but I love, you know, nonfiction memoirs, journals, and books Mm -hmm. of letters. Like, it's like, oh my God, yes, (laughs) please. Um, So I had, um, there are, a couple that I, I, there were a lot that I, I put away. Cause I was like, Oh my God, there's oh. all <laughs> I'm excited to see life. whatever you do hold up. <laughs> so this is um, a recent read that is one of my favorites. And it's also one of those slightly foxed, which is again, that nice size to, to hold. And it's just those naked hardbacks, but this was just the most wonderful one. And it was to war with Whitaker. Um, and it's oh. the wartime diaries of the Countess of Ranfurly. And if I've mispronounced that, wow. don't at me, people. Because, you know. <laughs> um, and so it's uh, her war diaries between 1939 and 1945. And she had chutzpah. I mean, she, um, you know, she married uh, her husband, who was she married into, you know, the uh, British aristocracy. Um, oh. She was when he was called up, she was determined to follow him. So um, she did that and she was notorious in um, Egypt and, uh, you know, really sort of that theater, uh, Uh that war theater. And, you know, admirals just were like, oh my God, get her away from me. like she wow. outmaneuvered them to to get posted and when she didn't she would use contacts so that she could stay so that she could be closer to her husband oh and so goodness. it's just it's interesting and it's filled with filled with characters but what was the overriding theme was here was this woman who really wanted to do her part and be close to her husband mm. and it's just a really lovely lovely story um from wow. for that. I mean, it's not really a story, it's her, you know, diaries, but her diary. Yeah. Diaries, but I loved that. Um, wow. and, and then another one um, is, I don't know if you've uh, read that. I know that you've, um, was it Amelia? I forget which. Uh, oh, uh, Amelia B. Edwards. Amelia B. Edwards. Uh, this is, I don't, you may have read some of uh, Freya Stark's um, 
you know, uh, oh. memoirs and her travels, but she was a British explorer. She started really traveling in the 1930s and she traveled, I think until like the sixties and seventies, she lived until about 19 in the early 1990s. But, um, you know, she traveled alone and she really traveled in the thirties to places that kind of like Gertrude Bell um, in the oh. Middle East where women hadn't traveled before. Um, wow. And she has really great insight and, you know, lots of ingenuity and they're just really delightful. And there's a, there's a, huge series of her different her different books so wow. um, and then I just have one other uh, which will be part of the Mitford theme too so this, this is the letters uh, between Deborah Devonshire and Patrick Lee Fermore mm. so and he was um and they're just charming and witty and, you know, there are different people that they talk about. And, you know, she was, um, I think she was the youngest Mitford. She's the one mm -hmm. that ended up marrying the uh, Duke of Devonshire. And, and you know, Patrick mm -hmm. uh, Fermore was um, the, okay, I'm going to have a toppling pile of books in a second. Um, <laughs> You know, he, it, it was it, that period of time in between um, the wars where if you were, you know, in the UK and you, you would just travel on the continent with like letters of introduction and you would just walk all through and you would just show up at like so-and-so's house and wow. they would welcome you in. And <sighs> when I say house, I say that loosely because mostly they were like castles and <laughs> and stuff like that. So, oh my goodness. Um, and so his travels are really wonderful to read. And um, they just had a lovely, lovely correspondence. And I just really wow. encourage um, if you, you haven't, you know, and if you like the whole Mitford family, you know, mm -hmm. um, and of course there's the, you know, the go-to of the letters between the six sisters. So that's also a big old one. book that has been sitting on my shelf for a year now and I want to get to it. Now, Deborah's husband, did you say his name was Patrick Firmer? No, he was a friend. Her husband oh, okay. was of Devonshire. I um, see. So was friends Because he was the, Patrick Lee Firmer is the one who wrote the travel memoirs. Yes. Okay, okay. Those are ones I've heard of. I know Susan Hill, um, oh. her bookish book, uh, Howard Zen is on the landing. I love that book. It's such a good book. And there's several titles on there that ever since I read it, and I have it somewhere, the, you know, that book, uh, I'm just, I need to get to those. I want to try them. So I, I encourage that. And I, I love letters because also like, if you feel you're stressed or whatever, it's like, I love reading like maybe one or two, like if I know I'm going to have a busy day and I'm maybe not going to get much reading except what I listen to in my car. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I love like maybe reading a letter or two in the morning because you oh. know, a lot of times they're just, you know, snarky and funny, yes. and like, yeah. you know, a world entirely different from my own. And yet also there are definitely themes and, you know, we all have like human experiences that are mm -hmm. relatable to, to everyone. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, love definitely. That. Yeah. I know. Um, Elizabeth Gaskell's is it, can we see it from there? Yeah, there, there she is <laughs> her, her letter collection. That's I, I actually, cause of the social that we're going to have to do with Elizabeth Gaskell soon, I want to look up some of the highlights so I could have some things to share. Yeah. It's, oh, it, it, and it's really just a way to get up close and personal and feel like you're in their daily life kind of mm -hmm. knowing what, what, it, what was it like to be them? Yeah. They're really, really special. And I do worry nowadays that with letter writing being so rare, I know. Um, kind of I know. what are we going to be left with? But hopefully there are enough people still doing it. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I mean, luckily there's enough out there of letters to that. I haven't read <laughs> You know, yeah, well. that's true. Um, you know, of people that I'm interested in, but yeah, no, I think it's a real um, interesting. Like, I, I think we talked about um, the Janice Hallett, the appeal, where you know that book is is written in sort of you know memo text format. Yes, um, but it, 
it, it does, you know, the one thing it doesn't have is uh, the, the immediacy of, of knowing that this was someone who was actually communicating with another person in real wow. life with real, you know, world events going on and yes. the world characters who had, you know, spiffy little nicknames and did things yeah. they shouldn't have done. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that I, um, that Maud uh, illustrated diary of a Victorian lady, just the, the hijinks they get up to, like they, one of the traditions they would do is on New Year's Eve, I think it is jumping over a lit candle and something, I can't remember, somehow you would figure out who you were going to marry from that. <laughs> I'm hopefully not I remember it was like it's on fire. Yeah, the exact, that's what I was like, all the petticoats, it seems like such a fire hazard. Yeah, I know that is risky. Yeah. Very maybe. much so. Yeah. Yes. Entertaining. Yeah. All righty. Um, are we on to cozy thing seven? Yes. So another segue. So it would be no surprise that if I like letters and journals, I love epistolary novels. So, oh. you know, it's just, of course, I'm like, yeah. Okay, that's <laughs> wonderful. And this is one, and I actually saw this at one point on um, Miranda Mills. Uh, oh. She had recommended it. And yes. I can't recommend this enough as a light, enjoyable, quirky read. It's um, oh. a young woman who goes to work at a department store. And boy, oh boy, does she want to make some changes. And there are little, um, you know, there are wonderful little sketches in, involved. Oh, wow. And a love interest. And it's just, it, it's got that sort of Woodhouse vibe to it, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, it, I just, I loved it. As a matter of fact, I, I was like, you know, I need to reread that. So, um, that sounds so delightful. And I have to say, like anything set in a department store in the past, I'm just like, yes, please mm -hmm. sign me up. I think ever since watching um, the Paradise miniseries, oh. um, yes, that made me really, really want to um, just anything with that setting. I'm like, yes. Um, I have not seen the series. I don't know why, but I don't watch a lot of TV necessarily, and I need to, to like watch that. Um, but wow. I read the the book, and I loved the book. Really? I, oh, that's I like Zola. So it was Zola, right? So yes. I get those French authors a little. Confused. I know. I know. No, that's exciting, especially because I was just making up the poll for um, July August or July August read, and Carolyn is nominating um, the Ladies Paradise for her oh. pick. Yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. And I, um, I've um i not read the 20 tone <sighs> series that it is part of, although I'm thinking about it. I was like, well, why not? Why, why shouldn't I? Yeah, um, I, I got stuck in Cousin Bet. And I think I was in denial that I just wasn't enjoying it. I like, I, I want to, you know, read more French literature. But um, so I'm like, I think I just need to call it quits with Cousin Bet. And I think I'm just going to, I'm fine just diving in and not reading the 20 prior. Right. Oh, season. yeah. It's, it's, it was a, I have, I had not read any of the others and it, it was definitely a wonderful standalone. So okay. I would oh, um, cool. highly recommend it. And it would be a great reread too. Like I would love Excellent. to read it. So, okay. um, cool. yeah. Um, and then the other one, um, because I just love, Evelina by Frances Burney. Oh, I just love it. I love that cover. I know, right? So fun. I love these covers too. They're great. They really are. And this, I just encourage everyone who, you know, is maybe like concerned about, um, you know, reading language. classics and language and that's such a great way to put it. You know, this is just very accessible and it's fun and there are hijinks and, you know, uh, there's a, uh, you know, you love the, and are rooting for Evelina, which is really nice. And yes. um, so definitely. Oh, that's lovely. Yes. And <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> now I know some of us at Christmas time, we read, what is it called? Ah, uh, 
Christmas or last Christmas in Paris or am I kidding? Am I totally, but it's Hazel Gaynor. Okay. Um, and that one is all written in letters. It's World War One. Um, <laughs> and that one, it's it's one of those special books that deals with harrowing times and settings um, and kind of cushions the blow without making it saccharine. Um, yeah, so that's that's an, an epistolary one I've really enjoyed. And I'm trying to think, I know there is an audiobook, um, another one, maybe I'm just thinking of that one, but the audiobook of that is cool because it has all different narrators for um, the different letters. Which um, is helpful too, so that you, you yes. really start to get the rhythm because sometimes like yes. even in reading them, you know, you have to be like, okay, who am I? You know, they use, um, I think in, in this one, it's, uh, it's easier to, to determine who, who's writing whom, you know, without, and getting to right. the rhythm of their voice. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, it can be difficult. Yes. So. Well, shall we do a cozy thing eight? So I, um, as we, we've talked about is I love, you know, I do read, you know, a substantial amount of nonfiction mm -hmm. and in that, like, there's a really sort of cozy genre of, of biographies that I really love. And that is, um, very sort of engaging narrative driven biographies, not necessarily timeline driven, but really ones that tell a story. And in thinking about it, cause I was like, okay, so you're gonna say that and then what are you gonna say about it, right? Um, <laughs> in preparation for our chat, I was thinking about ones that really I loved. And um, so Stefan Zweig, uh, who wrote two, he wrote uh, that I've read, are Marie Antoinette and then um, Mary Stewart for Mary Queen of Scots. Um, they're just incredibly engaging. And it's because he was a, to me, a, a fiction writer um, and probably foremost a, a fiction writer that you just get this really lovely storytelling um, where it becomes very compulsive reading and it's mm. not daunting and yet you are getting all of the facts and all of the the you know timelines and and I know that some traditional historians you know especially more current would be like well is there a little opinion woven into that and I would say probably yes to a certain extent but not in a way um, that I would disagree with mm -hmm. so um, mm -hmm. And I would also, for all of you Nancy Mitford fans, her nonfiction, her Madame Pompadour, her Frederick the Great, um, her the, uh, the Sun King are oh. immensely readable, super mm -hmm. enjoyable. And I would, I would recommend all three. I've, I've read them and loved them. So, wow. but it's, it's funny. And I, and I noticed that cause I, in reading the, uh, the, the recent, um, Nancy Golton, listen, read, cause I, um, I had, I once again, plug for the library, borrowed the audio from the library. Yay! Hard copy book at home. Um, so, and I noticed that awesome. she, she had that sort of engaging, um, narrative and um, where she threw in a few opinions, but she was very clear to say, you know, like this is is what I think kind of thing. And I was like, okay, you're telling a, you know, you're telling me what you think. You've done a lot of study. So I really loved that. Mm. So it's sort of that little, you know, subgenre. And not too many people, if any, who are historians um, do that very much anymore. So but if you have someone who you know is sort of a little, you know, nonfiction adver averse, but loves, you know, sort of like, you know, Marie Antoinette or Mary Queen of Scots or whatever, yeah. I would highly recommend Stefan Zweig, so. Yeah, and I think, especially with someone with Marie Antoinette, I feel like there are details about her life that are so like truth is stranger than fiction and oh. just scream to be written about. Um, so, oh, I'm, I'm very intrigued to try out this new author because I do, I love a gripping biography. Um, yeah, so that could be, oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Um, the next one, this will be sort of, this is like the continuum, um, women writers between the wars. I mean, I just, you know, um, Nancy Mitford, Elizabeth Bowen, um, Elizabeth Taylor, Barbara Pym, you know, they've all, they all wrote 
between the wars and then after. But one that I feel like doesn't get a lot of um, attention, and I absolutely loved this book, was The Homemaker by uh, Dorothy Canfield Fisher. And she was a contemporary and friend of Willa Cather, who I also love. Um, wow. And so but this, um, you know, and a shout out to Persephone, because I love, um, you know, Persephone, whoops, uh, bookmarks. There it is. <laughs> I know, right? The, that special. Uh, yes. I the love the end papers. I know. And I love the fact that like, you know, and I know a lot of people have complained like, oh, it's just the dove color. But then I was like, you open it and then you get these riotous end papers that are very individualized and very specific to totally. you know, the book and the author. And um, and so I love the that that detail that goes into it. Um, so I would um, this is a, a sort of it, it's a it's a very modern tale in, in mm -hmm. a way because it's it's a it's just a very small story. It's a sm story of a family, and the mother and the father really aren't suited in the roles that they are, mm -hmm. and how they blossom when there's a change. Um, and it's just this lovely, lovely story, and I I can't i i love it i think it's a i think she's one of these underrated you know american authors that we don't read enough and we don't mm -hmm. talk about enough and i think that she's um from what i've read ha has a tremendous amount of talent and a lot to say and um you know i i i love a quiet story you know there's it, it's very enjoyable to me so i mean i'll read a big tome too but sure. you know, a, a quiet domestic story um with a slight twist is is really um, interesting. So, I have to say, when people talk about Persephone books, The Homemaker is one of the I feel like the greatest hits of Persephone, and it keeps keeps coming back and being recommended to me. And I'm reminded once again, like this is a book I need to try. And if I like a writer's reading style they can write about the most mundane things and I will love it. So if I like her reading style, I am totally on board and excited for a quiet novel. Um, and you know what's interesting is that just jogged my memory of, I just read um, Ramona and her father. Okay. <laughs> is, you know, very different kind of book. It's children's literature, but it's about a time when Ramona's father gets laid off from work and he ends up spending a lot more time with her than he would and the mom goes to work full time and i love it's in the 70s and so the older sister says mom are you going to be liberated now <laughs> um and uh so she gets all this time with her dad that she wouldn't have gotten otherwise and the happy resolution at the at the end is that her you know her dad gets the job and also at this time, like he was making so much more than her mom would be able to make any place. So the family is all happy about that. But there was, you know, a silver lining to that kind of scenario. <laughs> now, um, another Persephone that is very quiet, but almost I think of it in the pursuit of love category with these deeper themes is guard your daughters. Have you read that one? I have not. That one is it's it's pretty serious because it's about a mom with mental illness and everyone in the family is um kind of let's all act like everything's okay that's what we're we're gonna do to cope and um but the the bond that these sisters have i think it's five sisters it's been a few few years since i read it and it makes these really kind of mundane moments like them all trying to share the bathroom and get ready um, for something just but all the like conversations happening at once really beautiful and consoling um but then at the end you're like whoa you know some some of the daughters are able to get out and get married but then some are still young and um they all just living with the person who is really just out of touch with reality and her emotional intelligence is just nil but a really a really powerful read so not so much a comforting one um, but a really special book. Yeah. And I love the range that Persephone has. Like, I mean, I think, um, you know, the ones that I've read, I mean, I love, um, uh, what is it? 
the making this. of the marchioness. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. And I like that they did the bind up. I know, I think when you were, you were talking about it a while ago, you were talking about how like the first half and the second half are like two separate like books yeah. and they really are like they, they did a bind up of, of the two where you're like, Oh wow. Like the first was, you know, this very light. And the second one's a little darker. Like a thriller but, almost. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh. um, but um, you know, and, and the shuttle, I, uh, I, I, and it's it's not a light story. I, I yeah. much in the vein of um, the one you were referencing, where it is you know um, it's the darker side of it's sort of the the dollar heiresses. Yeah, um, and yeah. and yet I loved it. It was one of those ones, and it's yeah. a thicker one. And I was like, okay, I'm reading this until I'm done. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also Someone at a Distance by Dorothy Whipple. Oh, it's yeah. about the husband having an affair with this young thing that comes to the house. Oh, and so that is really. so not normally my type of book, but because I felt like it was not done at all. Like, Ooh, look at this juicy tale. I'm going to tell you. It's like, let me show you these people that are fully fleshed human beings, even the other woman, you know, who hey. Where, who all, often people resent the other woman more than the man who left with the other woman. Um, and let me just show you kind of, and also it just feels so real how things gradually start to unravel. Um, and I think the reason why I still loved it too is that at the end, I feel like she gave all the, the family that, um, all of the family, she gave them dignity where they should have been given dignity. Um, yeah, another really special one. I would like to read more by Dorothy Whipple as well. I, for some reason, could not get on with high wages, um, but I know I, I have. That yeah, that's that's one that a lot of people like. That's the department store setting, so I wanted to love it. Okay. Um, but I have Green Banks by her. I'm pretty sure that's the other one I have. So I so read anyway. The Priory, and I liked that. Um, I read Someone at a Distance. Mm -hmm. But that's all that I've read of hers, of Dorothy Whipple. And I liked both of them. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So there are, yeah, just many exceptional women that were, were writing at that time. Um, so there's so it's really special, you know, places, uh, publishing houses like Persephone and Virago, uh, just yeah, putting books out there that we wouldn't know about. And then also I know. Um, Elizabeth Brink, that's a part of the our, our group. She has read a lot of the, um, oh goodness, Fairview Press. Um, and they, I'm trying to think, Elizabeth Fair is one of the authors, Molly Keene. Um, yeah, so. Molly Keene, Good Behavior. That's always a good one. Yes, I haven't read it, but I hear such wonderful things about it. Yeah. No, there are so many, uh, I mean, you could do like a whole year of only reading, yes. you know, women authors, both, and I would throw in the, the American authors too. Mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, usually when we discuss it, we just discuss the, the British women authors, but, um, and, and really get a very broad experience. Like it wouldn't be like, oh, I'm just reading the same thing or, you know, or it's, you know, bright young things doing something again, or, yes. you know, heartbreak or, you know, I really feel like, you know, maybe it's also because we're, you know, the way we choose the books that we read that there is this, this wonderful, you know, um, broad experience like D.E. Stevenson I would throw her in there I love her books like they are just yeah. such a wonderful warm you know cozy mm -hmm. book to to do and for and Elizabeth Van Arnhem I think she was writing what a little bit before and then into if I've got it yes. um you know yeah. some of hers are wonderful and then some of hers are really dark like I, Vera yes dark it and it's just weird <laughs> it's just such a weird book I um, did not expect I mean the end no. and I was just like oh my gosh yes yeah just odd 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 um what else oh and Elizabeth Googe who I'm obsessed I love with. her she, I'm new yes. to Elizabeth Googe and I 
credit you and, and, and booktube where I was like, why have I not read her? And I love her. What, have, what did you end up reading by her? So I've read the first in the Cathedral series, the first in the... Is it Elliot, Elliot Family Thank trilogy? you. I was like, oh, I can never name that, say the name. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I read The Scent of Water and Island Magic. Oh. So, I haven't read, that's one that I haven't read. And I know a lot of people really like it. And then also in that era, you have like Josephine Tay and Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers. Um, and one I just, Christina Hardiment, she wrote um, the books that Nanny McPhee is based on. Oh, okay. Uh, Nurse Matilda. But then also I know Janelle from Two Fondant Books. Um, she has really enjoyed her detective series. Yeah, there's so many wonderful ones. And that's so funny because it's like you were being a little preemptive because number 10 is the golden age of mystery. <laughs> wow. This that was is a nice flow. Gorgeous. I have to say yes. this. Was... <laughs> what, who are your like top kind of, or top books or authors? So, okay, sorry. Uh, I just read Have a Car Case and, um, and I may have read it like, years ago like we're talking like 20 years ago and I had not read it again and I loved it I love the character of Harriet Vane I love that she is you know she grapples with being a professional you know woman and yet you know having Lord Peter who is you know absolutely uh you know besotted with her and and, yes. and that you know Dorothy Sayers has that she really loves her characters like she mm -hmm. like if she was probably writing a man that she would like to have dinner with i feel like lord peter is it yeah uh, or mary <laughs> right or mary or have like dinner every night with yes. um, for the rest <laughs> of their lives um, which i i really i love um so um, that was one that I, if you haven't read, and you can read it sort of out of sequence. I mean, yes, Strong Poison is sort of the first one in that, that series, but uh, mm -hmm. with Harriet Vane, but it's definitely, you know, a, a standalone. I'm a huge yeah. Josephine Tay fan. I love her. And uh, I don't know if you've seen, they're doing a, a, a British reissue and the covers are amazing. I think it's oh, in like September. To... Oh, who, do you remember which like publisher is doing it? I think it's Penguin. Oh my goodness. This is so exciting. Yeah. yeah. She, were you one of the people last summer when I read um, Miss Pym Disposes? Or did you? I was not, I had, to, I missed it. And I so wanted to, cause I love Miss Pimp Disposes. It's, it's enough. It's like, oh, it is the most agonizing and amazing book to read because it is just where, you know, so much doesn't happen until 75% through. And then it's a roller coaster. And then you keep thinking back on all the conversations that you heard before. And you're like, oh, Oh my goodness. And also I loved in the discussion, there was so much debate about what was actually, what had actually happened at the end. Yeah, it's, um, there's a really good um, backlisted, did a podcast with Val McDermott talking about Miss Pim Disposes. I'm so glad you jogged my memory of that because I started to listen to it before I had finished, I'm like, Kate, what are you doing? And I paused it. I was like, I'm going to go back after I finished it. Oh, thank you for reminding me of that. Yeah. And I just love uh, everything that you've said, the psychological element, the, the fact that, you know, a crime hasn't really been committed for an, ex you know, three quarters of the book, basically. And then, um, but you know, she, she does this wonderful job of, of taking us as a reader with that the atmosphere of it and the that there's something the psychological atmosphere of it that there is something that it's going to happen and just and, and yeah and I love how you were saying like where you, you kind of go back and pick up like should I have known should I pick this up like was this a red herring was this really did I you know um 
yeah, she does that. And one of my favorites of hers is um, the one on uh, Richard the Third. What is Daughter that? of Time? Daughter of Time, and the audio of that is amazing. Yes, I did the audio book as well, and it is, yeah, and it, it's so fun too because I think I love the movie Rear Window, and oh, yeah. Yeah. And so that to me is like, we get to have rear window as a book, <laughs> no, it's <laughs> but it's by Josephine Tay. Yeah. It's, um, that one is, you know, what's so funny too, is like, that one's more plot driven, but it's all about something that happened in the past. I don't know. That one feels more pacey in a way. I, I don't know. It's just, I think her writing is just magic. And that's why I feel that way. I think also it's because she, she also wrote for the theater so she yes. had this, you know, like she wanted to move us through arcs of a story. And I think she's mm. really good about that. Yeah. Um, and so again, like authors who write in a couple of different, you know, mediums, you know, I feel like they get like what it is to tell a story. And, and I don't want to mm. take anything away from, you know, all of the authors who, only write like fiction or nonfiction, mm -hmm. but um, you know I do I do gravitate towards a lot of times you know authors that um, you know write in, in different things like one who's another underrated uh, female author would be Martha Gellhorn who did all, all of this nonfiction, and yet she probably wrote one of the best novels of World War II, which is A Stricken Field. And of course she was, Ooh. you know, it, it's always been overshadowed by being Hemingway's wife and certainly mm. all of his work that, um, you know, she's someone that uh, I feel like uh, we should in fact read more of, you know, even just some of her nonfiction. Uh, because she had a really incredible voice and you know Steinbeck and Willa Cather and all they all wrote in you know fiction and non-fiction essays yeah. for newspapers and stuff so they knew what it took to really like tell a story and grab you and that's what I love about it yeah now speaking of Josephine Tay have you read the series that has her as a sleuth written by Nicola Upson I read, I want to say like the first four mm -hmm. and then like with a lot of series, I just sort of petered out and it wasn't anything, you know, as far as any dislike of the, of the, um, the series, it was just sort of, oh, and then, you know, something I picked yeah. up and, you know, but I, I only read the first one. Yeah. yeah. I yeah, and there, the ones I read. There's no lack of mystery series out there. So it's kind of, you just get drawn to the ones that, you know, you do and you make a lot of progress on those. Yeah. Um, and the other uh, just one is um, who's having a little resurgence on, oh, sorry, it, there's like so much glare, maybe if I hold my hand, um, is Mary Roberts Reinhardt. Oh. And I love that she's having sort of her moment on book two. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was at Janelle's, channel where she had the um where she she had a a group read I think a, I'm trying to remember thing. which one it was she had so many titles though I can't I can't remember so yeah. um and she really kind of gets overshadowed by the big three so mm -hmm. um yeah and I think that there are so many wonderful um uh you know Li uh, so many authors, I was going to say libraries, because then I was thinking that for me, I remember a period of time back when I was young that, you know, if you went to a smaller library, which, you know, I had, I, I did, uh, where you had so many of these older titles that you got to explore because, you know, uh, current fiction would be, they'd only get like one copy. And so the, yes. you know, the lines and stuff would be so, so long, the whole yes. lines that you would go and, you know, explore so many of these, you know, writers that, and authors that we just haven't, we don't talk about that much anymore. So, and I and feel like I, she's kind of in that category. I wish that libraries would, cause this is so sad to me, you know, these older, like, like the Mary Stewart books, I'm just waiting, like when the library is just not going to have any of them. Um, I loved her. Do tons of e-copies. You know what I mean? Like people read 
e-copies, like the either the audiobooks or ebooks, they'll do it. And I just, I just wish the library would buy more of those and don't clear out all the old books, please. I know. I mean, and I love Mary Stewart. I mean, let's, uh, mm -hmm. she is a lovely, lovely, like read. Um, yes. Um, yeah. I think Thorny yeah. Hold is maybe my favorite. Thorny Hold is way up there for me. Um, or and Nine Coaches Waiting. Nine Coaches Waiting, This Rough Magic, and what was the other one I was just thinking about the other day? It's the one with the nuns. <laughs> oh, I don't think I've read that one. It's not, I keep wanting to say wildfire at midnight, but I don't think it's wildfire at midnight. No, I don't remember nuns. Oh, and touch not the cat. That's one that I really enjoyed. Thank that you. one's fun because that one came out in the sixties and it has ESP as like one of the plot elements. <laughs> now about Mary Roberts Reinhardt, do you have a couple favorites that you would recommend? Because yeah. I read um, at the sign of the white cat and I didn't, it wasn't a huge hit with me, but I knew, and I knew there was enough there that I'm like, this is not the only one I'm going to try from her. I'm going to, I'm going to flub titles. So there's one about a staircase that I thought was really good. Oh, the circular staircase? The, yeah, the circular okay. staircase. And I really liked um, this one, the after house. Oh, the, I thought it said the affair house, but the, yeah, after, the house. after house. Okay. Um, it's set on a, um, if I remember it correctly, it's been a long time, um, set on a yacht, on a private yacht. So I love it. It's like, yes, please. Right. So it's, you know, you've got, you already know your cast of characters. Oh, so. yes. With all their rich people problems. <laughs> I know. I mean, <laughs> yes. Um, and I am so here for it. It's like every episode of Columbo that is like. <laughs> I love Columbo. I mean, it's, that is like a go-to. And I love what is that IMBD has them where with, right, for free, with the exception of the first yes. season. Like, why not? Why, why, why did they, I know, like, what is the licensing issue? Yes. Um, but I, I have to watch it in broad daylight, though, because it always starts out, not always, but many episodes where you're seeing the, the killing happen. Um, yeah, because I am a chicken. <laughs> Well, I love though, it's so, I love that the fact that you know who the murderer is, like, That's you know. A way to experience a story, a mystery sometimes. And um, oh, I, I watched one recently with um, John Cassavetes and Blythe Danner. And it was, he plays oh the composer, um, composer slash uh, maestro. Um, and, you know, it's set in the Hollywood Bowl and, you know, it's just so fun. Oh. Um, and I, it's such a great, and Myrna Loy is in it as, uh, yeah. as and I love Myrna Loy. Like yeah. she to me, I, I, from the golden age of Hollywood, I just, well, I love the Nick and Nora, you know, series, yes. even the older ones, which, you know, the later on in the series where you're like, wow, that's a really thin plot line. I'm like, I don't care. I'm here for it. <laughs> I've only watched the thin man, um, but I had no excuses because I was gifted a really nice uh, set that has all of the Thin Man movies. And I really love the Thin Man. So maybe I could talk the boys into watching them. With yeah. Me. And it's nice because other than the fact that there's like alcohol galore and maybe smoking questionable themes at times, <laughs> they're really lovely. And that also uh, brings up um, just sort of a golden age mystery Jason. I love some of the books that some of the movies in the 40s were made of from. So like one of my favorite uh, books is, um, oh, I'm gonna, I can't remember the name. It's the movie with Jean Tierney and um, she, she plays a murderess, basically. She yeah. is, um, is that Heaven Can Wait? I think it's maybe heaven can wait. I'm just going to quickly Google. Uh, that title sounds so familiar. 
Oh, I think I'm thinking of all that heaven allows. <laughs> that was, I think that's a more lighthearted one. Ah. And do you know from the beginning that she is a murderess? Um, you have, you know, earlier on it's how she's caught and I don't want to, there's a twist at the end that okay. is really, you know, it's definitely, um, shocking. Mm. Um, leave her to heaven. Oh, I got heaven in there. Oh, that, yeah, that was very close. Leave her to heaven. Oh, that so, sounds good. um, it's a, I highly recommend, uh, both the book and the, uh, the, uh, the movie, but I love that, that sort of genre and, and uh, mm. the Laura, which was what by Vera Caspre, I think her name was. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, uh, have, uh, that's such a great, uh, movie and, and mm. book. Um, oh, no, I did. I cut you off while you were recommending a couple of Mary Roberts Reinhardt. So what were you like the two favorites? Is it the circular staircase and the affair yeah. house or the, the after house? Sorry, the after house. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. And I haven't read her full, like I'm still exploring her. Uh, but mm -hmm. I actually picked this up at an antiquarian book fair at one point, And I was wow. like, I like mysteries and you know this sounds interesting and why not so uh, and this was actually the her her career I think was longer because like this one was is before really sort of the the golden age of mystery but we won't mm. tell anyone yeah yeah you're right and she had I mean such a long career too so it makes sense that she would have al already been writing before the golden age and digital copies, there's a lot that's, you know, yes. um, in the public domain. So there's so many wonderful, you know, ways to explore some of these authors uh, mm -hmm. without really having to, you know, a huge cost investment of anything. You know, if you don't yes. like the book, delete it from your library, you know, your <laughs> personal library, your digital library, like, you know, yes. so... Well, this has been so lovely. And I'm just, I'm like, <laughs> I was taking note of some things. I'm like, I want to look that up immediately, like after, after the discussion. So thank you, Susan, oh, for my um, thank you. Yeah, just a wonderful conversation. And I will, um, are you on Instagram or not really? I am. I haven't posted recently. It's today is for reading. Um, okay. Today is so I did make my account private, but I generally anyone who who you know sends me a a, a request, I invite. Yes. I just did that because I was like, I, I don't know if you got that, but like there was, I was inundated with a lot oh. of like, yeah, and I was like, I, you know, yeah. people sliding into your you know DMs and stuff, and I was like, I, I don't want to have to. I just want to talk about books, like I, I don't. Yes. Know. This is exactly. a dating site for me kind of thing. Thank you. <laughs> yes. No, if you can tell they're like a real person. Right. I was like, what, yes. what is this? Are you going to yes. try to fleece me of money? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you everyone for watching. And I will leave everything that was referenced in the description notes down below. And I hope that you have a lovely day.